Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. Today's case is a very interesting one where we know most of the answers, but we still have so many questions. We don't know why this crime occurred and the person responsible is not giving us any indication for what was going through their mind to the point where they thought murder was the right option. We can kind of gather what we can assume might have been the motive, but there are people involved in this case that have nothing to do with the person that was murdered, so this is definitely an interesting one. So after hearing all of the details, I'm really looking forward to hearing what all of you think. So this case starts on the weekend of August 27th and 28th, 2022. Two 16-year-old high school students, Gabriel Davies and Justin Yoon, went camping with some friends and family members at Panther Lake in Kent, Washington. While there, Gabriel and Justin were seen by friends leaving their cabin just after midnight on August 28th before they returned back to the cabin at around 6.30 a.m. Then, the two teenagers left the cabin once again at 11.45 a.m., and this time, they did not return but they did ultimately go back home. On the afternoon of August 31st, Gabriel left his home for football practice at the high school he attended. But by the time practice started, his coaches and teammates became concerned because he didn't show up to practice. Later that same day, Gabriel was reported as a missing person, and from there, an investigation began. As the searches for Gabriel started, police discovered his vehicle located in the Tenino area around 14 miles away from his home. Upon inspection, there was obvious damage to the exterior of the car. The door on the driver's side was still open and the key was still in the ignition. When they looked inside, they found what they thought looked like blood on the inside on the steering wheel as well as on the driver's side door panel. Then on the ground, just a few feet away from Gabriel's car, police found Gabriel's cell phone, which had been smashed. Then police went to the home where Gabriel was living and in his bedroom, they found a single spent 9mm shell casing but this shell casing wasn't collected at the time because it didn't seem to have anything to do with Gabriel's disappearance, which if you find a spent shell casing from a firearm and somebody is missing, you would think that would have something to do with it or at least collect it because there might be a possibility that a weapon could be involved, but I digress. But either way, police didn't search for long before they found Gabriel. He was located at around 10 a.m. on September 1st, wandering along the side of a road around three miles away from where his car had been located. At the time, Gabriel was wearing shorts, but he was not wearing a shirt, shoes, or socks. He had no visible injuries to him, so it didn't look like he had been wandering around in a deeply wooded area or anything like that during that 36 hours that he was missing. Once he was located, they took Gabriel in for questioning. Initially, Gabriel said that he couldn't remember what happened to him or even where he was during the time that he was missing. But then he would change his story, and instead he said that he wasn't able to tell police what happened to him because he was afraid that people were going to hurt him if he spoke up. Then he admitted that he smashed his own phone and left it on the side of the road on purpose because he was afraid of what police would find on it. Now, of course, when Gabriel initially went missing, police just thought that this was your run-of-the-mill missing persons case, and that was it. But the same day that Gabriel was located, someone else had also been reported missing. On September 1st, 2022, Co-workers called the police to report that they were concerned for the well-being of a 51-year-old man named Daniel McCaw. They said that he hadn't shown up for work in four days at that point, and this was very out of character for him. If he was going to be away for that long, he would have at least called in and let people know. So, police responded to the address located in Ording, Washington to do a welfare check on this man. When they arrived, they tried knocking on the door multiple times and tried different points of entry, but nobody answered. 
Immediately, though, deputies said that they smelled the odor of a decaying body coming out of the closed front door of the home. Then, police noticed a German Shepherd running back and forth inside and out of the house via a doggy door that led into the backyard. So, police inspected the outside of the home, and they found an unlocked door on the side of the house that led inside into the laundry room. So, police entered in that way. But immediately upon entering, police saw what looked like blood spatter on the washing machine just inside of the door. They said that the door was partially blocked, but they were able to push it open. And when they did, they found a body lying on the floor in the laundry room, surrounded by a giant pool of blood. He was found lying on his back with his head resting on his left shoulder and his right arm extended away from his body. The elbow on his right arm was bent and twisted so that the palm of his right hand was facing the floor. His body had already been in a state of decomposition, with maggots all over his head and shoulder areas. Of course, these deputies called in backup to help investigate the scene. Upon inspecting the man, who was identified as Daniel McCaw, they found that he had died from a single gunshot wound to the head. The gunshot wound was located in the right temple area of his head, so they thought that maybe he had shot himself. They also found that there was no sign of forced entry into the home or a struggle of any sort. However, they found no gun near the body, and upon further inspection, they found that Daniel also had been stabbed several times to his stomach and chest area. At first, they thought that maybe this was just blood from the scene because his shirt was soaked in blood, but after looking, they did find that they were stab wounds, so this clearly could not have been a self-inflicted death. Police ended up finding a single spent 45 millimeter shell casing on the floor right behind Daniel's left shoulder, as well as a live 45 caliber round on the floor next to his body. Police then found another spent shell casing on the floor in the utility room, which was located just next to the laundry room, but this shell casing belonged to a 9mm handgun, whereas the other bullets were from a 45 caliber handgun. So now it was clear that there were two guns used in this crime. Then police went around the home to look for evidence as well. They located a detached shed on the property, and inside, they found an empty drum-style magazine with ammunition on the floor near that magazine. Then, they found numerous gun cases, ammunition, and reloading equipment in that shed as well. They also found two empty gun holsters, one belonging to a 9mm handgun and the other belonging to a 45 caliber. So again, there was evidence that there should have been those two guns in the shed, but they were missing. So at that point, it looked like they had been stolen. After finding Daniel's body, his body was sent to the medical examiner for an autopsy. The medical examiner found again that he had been shot once in the head with the projectile still in his head. But the ME also found another projectile in his abdomen, but there was no obvious entry for that bullet. He was found to have been stabbed several times, and he had several small wounds along his arm, wrist, and forearm, all which appeared to be defensive wounds. Meanwhile, of course, when police found his body, the next step in the investigation was to speak with Daniel's friends and family members to see who could have wanted to hurt him. Well, there were some co-workers of Daniel McCaws who informed police that Daniel had once been in a romantic relationship with a woman named Amanda Oliphison. Amanda was the mother of Gabriel Davies, so police found it peculiar, to say the least, that just after Gabriel Davies is reported missing and subsequently resurfaced, his mother's ex-boyfriend is also found dead in his home. At first, they didn't know for sure if the two were connected. But then they spoke with the father of Gabriel's friend, Justin Yoon. If you remember from earlier, Justin and Gabriel had been camping together when they left their cabin in the middle of the night before coming back and leaving again with the two boys going home. Just after that, Gabriel goes missing. So, Justin Yoon's father called the police to inform them that he believed that Gabriel may have been involved in a crime. 
This made police believe that there may actually have been a connection between Gabriel and his mother's ex-boyfriend. So, police actually found that Daniel had surveillance cameras around the exterior of his home. Of course, they looked at the cameras, and on that footage, detectives saw that at around 1.59 a.m. on August 28th, two individuals who appeared to be young, skinny males approached Daniel's home from the backyard. One male looked to have pepper spray on his belt. One of the teenagers was wearing a ski mask, dark-colored clothing, as well as dark Adidas shoes with three notable stripes. The other teenager was wearing a trucker-style hat, a long sleeve shirt, and dark pants, and both teens looked like they were wearing gloves. Then, the two teenagers entered the home through the doggy door, which again was in the back door of the home leading into the backyard. So, they entered through the backyard and then went through the back door in the doggy door. By 2.41 a.m., Daniel can be seen exiting the detached garage on his property. At that time, it appeared that Daniel was intoxicated because he was seen stumbling into his home by 2.47 a.m. Around that same time, the dog is seen suddenly running out of the doggy door and into the yard. A minute after that, both males are seen leaving the home through that side door. Again, that side door leads to the laundry room where Daniel's body was later found. Then, these teenagers are seen running back and forth from the home to the garage for about three minutes before they left the property at 2.52 a.m. Both teens were seen carrying something, and while police couldn't make out what these items were for sure, they looked like they could have been handguns as well as a toolbox. Of course, when police compared the images of these suspects entering and leaving Daniel's home to Justin and Gabriel, they felt like they had a match. Then, by September 2nd, Gabriel's father, Kenneth Davies, called the police and informed them that he knew more information about his son's involvement with Daniel's death. And he told quite the story. So, Kenneth told police that Gabriel told him that he was approached by Daniel's biker buddies who were a part of a local outlaw gang. These bikers asked him to steal something from Daniel's home. He said that these bikers threatened to hurt Gabriel if he didn't do it. So, Gabriel went to his friend, Justin, and together the two developed a plot to steal the item in question from the safe in Daniel's home. So, that weekend, the boys went camping, which was the perfect alibi because family members and friends could see that they were in their cabin all night. I'm sure that was the plan. I'm sure they didn't plan on anybody seeing them leave the cabin that night. But either way, on that weekend, Saturday night, going into Sunday morning, they went into the house, sneaking in through the doggy door. Gabriel had known where the guns were kept in that house for reasons I will explain in just a few minutes, but Gabriel told his father that once Daniel entered the home unexpectedly while they were also in there to rob him, Justin started running after Daniel and stabbed him. After that, Gabriel heard a gunshot. Then Gabriel went out to the garage to get the item out of the safe, but when he did that, he heard a second gunshot. The two then fled the scene before they dumped the gun somewhere near the home. So, already, the story kind of doesn't make sense. If they are just there for the item in the safe, and the safe is located in the garage, why did they enter the house at all? That's my first question. If they were just waiting for Daniel to leave his garage so that they could sneak in there, get the item in the safe, and leave, why didn't they just wait outside or in a car, watch for him to leave, and then enter the garage after him to make sure that they wouldn't be caught? I know these are two 16-year-olds, but it doesn't take a genius or a criminal mastermind to just do that if you're going to steal something from somebody. After that, after stealing this item from Daniel's house, again, we know that they went back to the cabin and then went back home. The day that they got back home, Gabriel told his dad that he had been driving his truck when the biker buddies started following him before pulling him over on the side of the road, the same road that Gabriel's truck was later found. He said that when they pulled him over, they got him out of the car and started smashing his face into the inside of the car. That is where the blood came from that police found in the car. After that, they looked all around inside of Gabriel's car to look for the item that he had stolen from Daniel, but it turned out that Gabriel 
didn't end up stealing the item from him after all. So, obviously, they couldn't find it in his truck. Then, they took him away in their own car, roughed him up a little bit in the car, took his shirt and shoes before they released him. Which, when it comes to this story, I have another question. If Gabriel and Justin went to his house to steal this item because they were so afraid of these men killing him, why do they end up not taking the item that they went there for? You would think that if they were so desperate to get this item that that would lead them to doing whatever possible to get this item and especially if they just killed someone, nothing would stop them from getting the item that they needed but apparently they left without it for whatever reason. After hearing this very interesting story from Kenneth, police felt that they did have enough to arrest Justin and Gabriel as well as get a search warrant to search their homes. That same day on September 2nd, both Justin and Gabriel were arrested without incident. After being arrested, Gabriel and Justin pretty much knew that they were toast. They both took part in murdering Daniel, and then Gabriel went and faked his own disappearance. They didn't really push back much because they knew that they had been caught. And as police will tell many suspects in murders like this one, if they help the police out just a little bit, if they cooperate and they help police find more evidence, such as finding the guns that were involved in the shooting, then maybe they would go easier on them. So, Gabriel told the police that when they entered Daniel's home, they found and stole his own firearms to shoot him with. Then, after the shooting, they disposed of the firearms. Gabriel ended up showing police where he disposed of the guns, which were located inside of a military-style ammunition can. The two guns detectives found inside of this can were a 9mm handgun and a 45 caliber handgun. These two guns matched the empty holsters that were found in Daniel's home, as well as the magazines that were missing their respective guns as well. Additionally, police found a bag that contained 12 throwing knives and then another pouch that contained six additional throwing knives, as well as three other knives still in their sheets. These bags were found alongside the ammunition can that had the guns inside of them. So at this point, both teens were charged with first degree murder, burglary, and two charges of unlawful possession of a firearm, and both were denied bail. At that time, both were charged as adults. The next matter is uh, State versus Justin J. Yoon. The defendant is present in custody at Raymond Hall, appearing video via video with his counsel, Ms. Angela Horwath, here for an arraignment. The state previously having filed an information charging the defendant in count one with murder in the first degree with a firearm and deadly weapon sentence enhancement, count two murder in the second degree with a firearm and deadly weapon sentence enhancement, count three burglary in the first degree, counts four and five with unlawful possession of a firearm in the second degree. The same concerns that I expressed with regard to Mr. Davies exist with regard to Mr. Yoon. The evidence that we have to date is that the two of them plotted and planned this murder. As the court pointed out, there was a substantial level of violence inflicted on the victim. Uh, with regard to the evidence of the planning and also evidence that they tried to conceal the guns and knives after the fact, just looking at the probable cause declaration, I do believe that there is a significant community safety issue involved given the uh, alleged level of violence that the uh, victim was apparently subjected to. I'm concerned also regarding the allegations of, of what had been apparently some attempt to either cover up or minimize any potential involvement in this. Court documents state Davies' family told investigators that the teens had gone on a camping trip at Panther Lake between August 27th and the 28th, but left their cabin a little after midnight. The documents also state the teens went to the victim's home and entered through a dog door. A video security system recorded two skinny teens at the property. A confrontation ensued, leading to the shooting death of the 51-year-old victim was the ex-fiancé of Davies' mother. Court documents went into grisly detail about the state of the victim's body. Investigators found what appeared to be a single gunshot wound behind the victim's right ear. An autopsy shows what appears to be multiple stab wounds. The prosecuting attorney says both teens have already tried to run. Given that he's already tried to uh, stage his disappearance, there's a concern for 
uh, a flight risk. The same concerns that I expressed with regard to Mr. Davies exist with regard to Mr. Yoon. And a particular concern is the fact that um, when detectives went out on Friday night to serve the search warrant, they saw that the defendant's family was packing up an RV uh, that night. Their concern was that they might be trying to leave the area. Now, at this point, if you don't believe Gabriel's entire story about the biker gang and Justin being the one to kill Daniel, because I certainly don't believe the story, you might be wondering what could have made Gabriel and his friend want to kill Gabriel's mother's ex-boyfriend. As of right now, we don't have a motive. There has never been one officially stated, and after their arrests, it doesn't seem that either boy has spoken much either. But we may be able to look into Gabriel's history to see at least what could have contributed to this crime. Now, let's take a few minutes to talk about Gabriel, his history, and what could have led up to him wanting to murder Daniel McCaw. Gabriel was born to parents Kenneth and Amanda Davies. However, when Gabriel was still very young, by September of 2009, after 11 years of marriage, Amanda and Kenneth split up. By that point, they had been separated for a year, and by January of 2010, when Gabriel was only three years old and his sister was seven, the divorce was finalized. After that, Gabriel and his sister spent weekdays with Amanda and weekends with Kenneth. At the time, both Kenneth and Amanda lived in Thurston County, Washington. After the divorce, Amanda remarried about a year and a half later in August of 2011, but once again, Amanda would be divorced for a second time in April of 2013. I don't know the details from this, but it appeared that there was domestic violence issues going on in the home. According to court documents, Amanda's then-husband had been removed from the home after domestic violence accusations. After the separation, Amanda took the kids and moved an hour away to Gig Harbor, Washington. Then, four years after that, when Gabriel was about 12 years old, Amanda and the kids moved in with another man, Daniel McCaw, who was living in Ording, about an hour away from Gig Harbor. However, after Amanda moved in with Daniel, Kenneth was not happy. He said that he didn't approve of the original move four years before, but that time he let it slide. But now, they moved again without his permission, and now they were living with another man that Kenneth did not approve of. Because of their divorce and shared custody, Amanda was supposed to petition to a judge for permission to move, but she didn't do that. At that same time, Kenneth noticed that his kids weren't doing as well in school as they normally had done before all of this moving around. In the custody battles, he wrote about his numerous concerns. Both Gabriel and his sister had poor attendance records and their grades were dropping. When Gabriel was still in elementary school, he got in trouble two times for harassment or bullying and one other time for disruptive conduct related to a dangerous weapon. I wish I knew a little bit more about that situation, but if I had to guess, I would think that he probably brought something to school like a knife or had something that he definitely shouldn't have, maybe a throwing knife. Then, by middle school, Gabriel got in trouble for causing violence without a major injury. So maybe he punched someone, kicked someone, something like that. They didn't get a big injury, but obviously, you can't just be hurting other kids at school. That was in 2017. Now, that past Christmas in 2017, Amanda and Daniel had gifted Gabriel a 22 caliber rifle. Well, in 2018, Gabriel got in trouble for bringing bullets to that rifle to school. He was suspended for this. Not only was Kenneth concerned about Gabriel, but he also saw some red flags with Daniel himself. Kenneth said that his daughter, or Gabriel's sister, had been dating a boy, as teen girls do in high school. And apparently, Daniel didn't like the kid, so he threatened to kill the boy. Apparently, Daniel even told Kenneth that if the boy returned to his home, that he would end up in jail because he wanted to hurt the boyfriend so badly. We don't know a lot about that situation. Maybe it was an overprotective father figure type of thing, or maybe it had to do with the boy's race. I say that because Kenneth also noticed that Daniel hung a Confederate flag along with the American flag in his front lawn. Say what you want, but the Confederate flag is a pretty obvious sign of racism, American flag is just fine, but obviously the Confederate flag, 
not a great thing to be hanging up in your front lawn. Then, when Kenneth picked Gabriel and his sister up from Daniel's home one day, they told Kenneth that he had another flag inside. This one had an embroidered swastika on it. However, with these accusations, Daniel came back to defend himself. He admitted that he did have a Nazi flag, but it was a collector's item. He collected numerous flags, including a Japanese flag, a Marine Corps flag, and a pirate flag. Then, when it came to the boyfriend, he said that he yelled at Amanda's daughter's boyfriend because he snuck into their home and stole one of their iPhone chargers, but he says that he regrets how that situation was handled. But beyond this, there were a few other concerns that police knew about because they had been reported by family members and neighbors. Apparently, Amanda called for a welfare check on Daniel because when she spoke with him on the phone, his words were slurring pretty badly. This may have been before they moved in together or maybe it was during a weekend that the kids weren't there. But either way, Daniel was known to be a heavy drinker and when officers arrived that night, they noticed that he was intoxicated but he didn't seem to be a danger to himself or anybody else. He was in the privacy of his own home. He wasn't hurting anybody. He wasn't trying to drive. There was no reason that Daniel should have gotten in trouble or anything for drinking in his own home. Then there was another time where Amanda was, I guess, seen locked out of Daniel's home. And I guess she was yelling and banging on the windows to try to get inside. Neighbors heard the commotion and called the police. And when they arrived, Amanda told them that she was just trying to see if Daniel was okay. But again, police found no issues with Daniel because it was his home. I guess for whatever reason, he locked Amanda out. So police told Amanda to leave the property. So with these stories, it doesn't build to enough to constitute domestic violence or to say that the children were being abused or neglected but it does show that they didn't have the most stable home life. Having a heavy drinker like this in the home is not the best thing for kids to be around. And Amanda, you know, breaking up with someone and then moving and then breaking up with them and moving again, that's just not the best situation for kids to be living in anyways. So, after all of these concerns were raised, it did seem that the judge decided that the best, most stable situation for the children was for them to live with their father, Kenneth. So, by the summer of 2018, the kids were sent to live with him, just in time to start the new school year. Again, this did seem to be the most stable situation. Obviously, it wasn't the ideal situation because moving again is definitely not easy, but the hope was once they move this one time, that'll be it and they'll be able to just adjust into their new home life. But it wasn't long before more concerns were being raised. By January of 2019, Gabriel's older sister, who was 16 at the time, had been pulled out of class by a guidance counselor because her grades were dropping. But it was at this time that she confided to the counselor that her dad was physically abusive at home. She said that her dad would drink so much that he became aggressive and angry and would grab her wrists to the point of injuring her. She said that her dad would go after her brother as well, but she did her best to protect him from their father. So, this prompted the school to get CPS involved, and when they spoke with 12-year-old Gabriel, he told the worker that he was scared of what would happen once his sister left for college. He said that he didn't want to be left alone in the home with his father. For a short time, the kids lived with their mother again while the courts investigated, but the case was later thrown out by March of 2019 because they didn't find that there was sufficient evidence to show that there was any abuse happening. So, they returned to their father's care. By January of 2020, a judge ruled that the kids would live with their dad on the weekdays and with their mother on the weekends. That was the permanent ruling. At some point after that, Amanda and Daniel broke up and went their separate ways. But if what Kenneth said about him was true, maybe there is more to the story. I mean, clearly, it seems that Gabriel didn't have many positive male influences in his life to begin with, but maybe Daniel was treating them worse than we know. Maybe Gabriel always had some sort of grudge against Daniel for whatever reason, but honestly, 
we don't know for sure because Daniel and Amanda weren't together anymore. So it's not like he felt the need to protect his mother from Daniel unless there was some sort of resentment or stalking or something happening behind the scenes after the breakup, but we don't really know. I really do wish that we knew more, but after the arrests, the families have all been very quiet. I haven't heard anything else about what Justin or Gabriel's families have to say about all of this in the past year or two. So to me, they're probably just keeping those details to themselves. So honestly, I don't really know. But either way, without telling a motive or speaking much further, both Justin and Gabriel ended up coming to a plea agreement with the prosecution. In the end, just recently, they both pleaded guilty to charges of second-degree murder in exchange for the prosecution dropping the charges of first-degree murder. It appears that there has not yet been a sentence, but the sentence ranges from about 10 years to 18 years, all the way to life in prison. Reports say that they should be sentenced on November 3rd, which is just a few weeks away from now, so as soon as I hear of the sentence, I will let you all know. But as of right now, that is all we know for today's case. This is definitely a crazy one, especially since we don't even know a good motive for this. I don't believe the story that they were just there to rob him, and I don't believe that Justin was the only one who partook in killing him. I think that they either both took part with one stabbing and one shooting, or it was Gabriel since he was the one with the personal connection to Daniel. I also don't believe that there was any biker gang involved. I know that Daniel was buddies with bikers. It did come out that they had been friends with like different bikers around the area, but I don't think they went and roughed up this 16 year old to get him to steal something for them. I definitely don't think that Gabriel and Justin went there with the sole intention of stealing from him because if they did, again, like I said earlier, they would have taken what they came for. If Gabriel was so scared of the biker gang that he went and killed somebody to get the item that he was meant to steal, he definitely would have made sure to steal the item that he was there to take in the first place. So in my opinion, I think that Gabriel probably went there for some reason. Maybe he had been like drinking, underage drinking that night and just had this idea. Maybe he was really upset with Daniel for something that had taken place in the past. Who knows what kind of motive there could have been, but when there is a sort of stepfather situation, I know that we're never married, but he was a stepfather figure. I know when there's this kind of situation, especially when someone is in these more formidable years in their teen years, there can be a lot of resentment. And especially if they were all afraid of him, if Daniel was doing more to them than they let on, if he was abusive, if he was abusive towards their mother, if he had been threatening their mother in the past weeks or months or days and Gabriel found out about it, there's any number of reasons why he could have wanted to go over there and kill Daniel. Maybe it was a spur of the moment thing where they just went there to confront him and they ended up shooting him and stabbing him. But to me, I do think that they went there with the intention of killing him. We just don't really know why. So the Gabriel aspect of this does make sense when you know that there is a connection, that there could have been more going on. We don't know the exact motive, but we do know that there's a connection. So the biggest question in this case is why did Justin involve himself? Were they camping together when Gabriel brought this up last minute and Justin just went along with it for the fun of it? Did they go camping with the specific purpose of creating an alibi after stirring up this plot sometime beforehand? Maybe they had been planning this for months or weeks and they used this camping day as the opportunity to create their alibi. I just want to know what Gabriel told Justin to get him to go along with this. Or did Justin want to be involved without Gabriel like convincing him for some reason because maybe Justin is just a disturbed person. Maybe they're both disturbed boys that just came up with this idea together. There are so many burning questions that I still have that I wish we could have answers to. I want to know so badly why these two boys were involved in this and I especially want to know why Justin partook in all of this. But as of right now, that is all we know. And now I want to know what you all think. 
Do you think there was a motive? If so, what was it? Why do you think Justin was involved? What do you think of Gabriel's tale about what happened? What do you think really happened in this case? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook account. All will be linked down below. If you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down in the description box below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.